to my best friends and engineer. I'm Lexi. And I'm Libby. And today we are going to actually take a little break from our usual programming of talking about our weeks as well as reading the um, DMs and Google Form submissions that you guys send in. And we're going to focus actually on talking a little bit about the Institute of Engineering and Technology. Yes. So they, um, Institute of Engineering and Technology has this award every year. It's called the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. And we actually had the pleasure of speaking to the um, award winner, Ella Podmore, and she is a materials engineer at McLaren, which you guys, if you don't know what the McLaren cars are, Google them. Wow. They're amazing. Just, I'm blown away. (laughs) Yes, it was awesome. I loved hearing about her experience. And we actually haven't had anyone in the automotive industry yet come on the pod. So that was awesome. Yeah. Before we get into the interview, we want to talk a little bit more about um, IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. Um, Obviously, you guys know we're so passionate about women in STEM and women in engineering, and we're really passionate and believe in um, what the IET does. All right, let's get into a little introduction about the IET organization. The IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year Awards have been celebrating women working in modern engineering for more than 40 years and aim to help change the perception that engineering is predominantly a career for men by banishing outdated engineering stereotypes of hard hats and greasy pipes. There are thousands of women engineers doing amazing things, from advancements in healthcare technology to space exploration. And the IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year Awards are all about showcasing the best woman engineering talent in this country, hopefully encouraging the next generation to get excited about the possibilities of an engineering career. Generally, people aren't aware of the incredible breadth of engineering in the 21st century. Engineering and technology are improving our world and shaping our future, touching every part of our lives. Engineers bring ideas to life, turn dreams into reality, and make solutions to big challenges possible. Recognizing and showcasing outstanding women engineers has never been so important. Even though one in five people work in the engineering profession, the UK faces a nationwide skills shortage. 203,000 people with engineering skills will be required each year to meet demand through 2024 but it's estimated that there will be an annual shortfall of 59,000 engineers and technicians to fill these roles. What's even more surprising is that just 16.5% of those working in engineering are women, highlighting that there's plenty more to be done to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion in STEM fields. So as well as highlighting women engineering talent, the awards seek to find role models who can help address the UK science and engineering skills crisis by promoting engineering careers to more girls and women. The IET wants to make it clear that engineering is a fantastic career for women. Outdated views and stereotypes are damaging to the industry, especially when there is a significant shortage of engineers, which poses a serious threat to the economy. It's vital we champion engineering. It's a diverse, creative, and exciting career, which offers the opportunity to do something life or even world changing. It's also really important to see the benefits that come from a diverse workforce, including a wider talent pool, improved creativity, and providing more role models to inspire the next generation. So now we want to talk a little bit more about what the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award platform can do for winners. So winning a YWE award can provide winners with a national and international platform to share their story. They have the opportunity to appear on TV, radio, and podcasts, as well as being invited to speak at various events across Europe. The awards increase the reach and impact of an engineer and allows them to connect and network with many high achieving and inspiring women in the industry. From supercars and submarines to healthcare and keeping people safe, some of The IET's previous YWE winners and finalists are doing incredible things every day to improve our world, and it's important for young people to see these visible role models. Each year, the IET holds an awards ceremony at their London venue, Savoy Place. The evening is always really inspiring and is a celebration of women who have made it all the way through to the final. The IET has had some incredible hosts over the years, from Carol Vorderman and Rachel Riley to Sandy Toxvig and Sam Quek. And this year's ceremony will be taking place on Thursday, December 1st. So watch this space. 
Applications for this year's awards are currently open, so if you know anyone who is smashing it in the world of STEM, let them know about the IET's Young Woman Engineer of the Year Awards. The deadline for applications is July 1st, so there's still plenty of time to apply. And I think with that, we can go ahead and get right into today's guest for the podcast, Ella Podmore. Welcome back to my best friends and engineer. Welcome to episode 23. Today we have a wonderful guest, Ella Podmore. Um, so she'll be speaking about her background in STEM as well as IET and um, some exciting initiatives that are coming up with them. Um, Ella, would you like to give a little background about your experience and kind of an intro to our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lexi, Libby, thank you so much for having me on here. Uh, my name is Ella Podmore. And I am a materials engineer working for the supercar brand McLaren Automotive. Um, But more recently, I was fortunate enough to win the IET, which is the Institute of Engineering Technology Young Women Engineer of the Year. So I won that in 2020. um, And some amazing things have come off the back of that, which I'd love to get into with you guys a little bit later on. But materials engineering is kind of my background in cars um, and yeah, just in the engineering space. I love that you're involved with cars. Can you give our listeners a little bit of background? Like what led you down that career path? Was that something you were exposed to when you were younger? Like just because I find that's so interesting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's kind of a weird one. Like I wasn't necessarily someone who you could always find under a car. Like I feel like everyone's expecting (laughs) me to be like, yeah, I grew up with just oil overalls. (laughs) (laughs) No, honey, that wasn't me. Um, Instead, like... Um, I grew up, uh, with, my dad was like a, a top tinkerer, I would call him. And basically what I meant is that he was constantly fiddles with cars and he constantly sort of taking things apart. And he always like instilled quite a logical thought process in myself. So I was always, always sort of understanding why is that connected to that and why have we got to take it apart to fix it and kind of understanding that logical um, thought process. But um, yeah, cars were kind of things that I watched on TV. It was, uh, we had this uh, program called Top Gear over here in the UK and that was something that my dad and I loved to watch together with my brothers. So I always like looked at cars. I was like, yeah, do you know what? They're glamorous, they're mm-hmm. sexy. These supercars are kind of something that I want to own. It wasn't necessarily something that I wanted to work towards. And um, it's a long old story, but I'll sort of shorten it down a little bit. And what basically happened is that I had a picture of like a McLaren P1 on my bedroom wall. And that's a particular supercar. So supercars being sort of a higher price bracket above sports cars. If you if you sort of say like £300,000, probably like $360,000. US okay. And um, I remember looking at this particular car and I was like, do you know what, why don't I apply to to go and work there? Like I can combine two passions. I like watching these cars and going to the races and enjoying that sort of lifestyle. But um, why why don't I go and apply and see what they had? And that's kind of the rest is history. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I love that. Awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So out of all the types of engineering, what drew you towards material engineering? Good question. So materials engineering was kind of... Um, A natural progression, when I was at school, I loved science, I loved chemistry in particular. And yes, I kind of understood that I wanted to problem solve. Dad was a great um, helper of me understanding what an engineer did. So I I sort of knew that they didn't all wear hard hats or I didn't always have to sort of wear an overall and work in a garage to be that kind of thing. Um, But chemistry was kind of my interest. And so I loved understanding about molecules, loved understanding um, about working on microscopes and things like that. So I kind of then wanted to take a path that allowed me to explore that chemistry side, but problem solving as well. So that kind of was like chemical engineering and then uh, materials engineering. And then obviously you get all these amazing open days and stuff. And I sort of saw what materials engineering did and it just blew my mind. Like (laughs) they were just (laughs) floating like superconducting (laughs) magnets and just all this stuff. And I was like, this is what I want to get into. And the beauty of it, shameless plug. Sorry guys, if you're not (laughs) materials engineers, this is cool. But um, I love the idea that I can get into anything. So yes, I've ended up with cars, but I could, I could translate that. Like materials kind of are the same everywhere. So yeah, are, I'm interested. Are you able to get into like a high level of what you do at your job with materials engineering in cars? Like, are you working on a specific component or 
the car altogether? Are you specializing on one thing? Like, what does that kind of look like with your career? Yeah, uh, so with specifically with my job at McLaren, I'm responsible for material related investigations on the supercars. So I'm lucky in the sense that I get to cover when we talk about the production or development of a particular vehicle you've got when the designers are first sort of putting pen to paper, drawing out these beautiful themes and stuff. And then you can work your way through validation, testing, um, customers owning it in the field, and then three, five year warranty at the end. And I'm really lucky in the sense that I get to do a bit of everything. So when designers are first sort of starting, they're putting pen to paper, figuring out what materials they want to use. We want to shave six kilos of this car. We want to make this look like in a particular way, like what kind of materials do we choose? So specification happens right at the beginning. And then validation testing, crash testing, get components back and see how if they're broken in the right way, if they're weathered in the right way, we get cars going out to Dubai, really high UV. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, UV levels. And then Sweden, like minus 20 degrees uh, centigrade. And then, so yeah, it really does. It I have a, like a, an amazing sort of reach and I love that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, all the way through to customer cars in the field, if they have like any customizations, guys love to jazz up their cars. Yeah. <laughs> love. You wouldn't believe I've had all sorts like, um, people wanting to match their fuchsia pink hairdryer to the new color, the car that they wanted. So we oh had like God. a hairdryer. Yeah. This guy brought in and he was like, I want to have a car. That's so um, funny. <laughs> I car. feel like it. I- I feel like it'd be easier to match the hair dryer to the car. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of the car to the hair dryer. <laughs> uh, the gold exhausts, diamond encrusted badges. It's crazy. Wow. So it'd be my job wow. to make sure that they, they are all like up to production intent. Awesome. So, and you're currently based in the UK uh, to provide some background. Um, so and you did school in the UK or did you go elsewhere for school? Yes, I was all schooled in the UK. Uh, I went up to study at a university called Manchester, which is quite like far north up in the UK. And now I'm currently based in London. Um, and yeah, I sort of haven't really ventured, <laughs> ventured <laughs> far. I, you know, I wish I sort of like had the opportunity to maybe go across the pond or like do something else in a different country. But I think um, the the whole idea like the the job that i've managed to land it kind of gave me a bit of a shock at the start and i i've fallen into something that i absolutely love um and the company's just nuts as well so i really love doing it so i haven't really changed I've been there four years ever since so that's all you can ask for right <laughs> yeah exactly i could go on nice holidays as well <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to bring that up because I feel like, so Libby and I are based in the U.S., you know, our listeners, I feel like, are mainly from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you speak a little bit more maybe about how the school, like, the processes during school, maybe if there's, if you guys have summer breaks, is there any internships you did? Um, I'm just wondering if there's any difference. Yeah, no, it's a good question because actually I would say I did have an internship or something we called an industrial placement year, which is something that like changed my life. And that's something that I would encourage all students listening, anyone who wants to get into the STEM STEM space, engineering space, internships, this kind of experience or insight is invaluable. But basically how it worked, Um, I was in high school until 18. And then 18 um, went on to study at university, which I guess is the equivalent to college with you guys. Um, And I was at university for four years because I did a master's and I got an MEng, basically a master's of engineering. Oh, wow. But one of those years was um, this industrial placement year. So it gives you an opportunity to do 12 months and like be based in a particular company and work there, immerse yourself in it. Your coursework is all about the experience that you're having. You still do a few exams, but it's not as intense like when you're just based in the classroom or lectures. Um, And yeah, it was that moment when I was applying to what company I wanted to go to for this industrial placement year that I looked up in, I was in my like little um, university room and I looked up and I saw this poster. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to see if they have anything there. And it's kind of a bit of a bizarre story because they didn't have a materials engineer. They sort of being in the motorsport 
and uh, automotive industry, they employed like mechanical engineers, automotive engineers. I mean, you guys probably hear it all the time in the sense that companies are recruiting from like quite a traditional talent pool. Mm -hmm. So we build cars, we want automotive engineers. And they, they were quite sort of um, old school in their thinking of what kind of reach they could get. And uh, I sort of got luck lucky, maybe I've got the right time, but I all think that these things interconnect, like, honey, if you've got to use luck, then you use luck. <laughs> but um, it was definitely one of those things. Um, I called up McLaren and then they said, yeah, we don't, we don't have a position for a materials engineer, um, but come down for an interview, we'll see what you're about. And I sort of managed to prove that I knew a bit about cars, um, but also played on the fact that, look, like we've got carbon fiber, this is a composite material that's going to be coming into to supercars and to other sorts of um, machinery, whatever it may be. Played on that a lot and they were like, fine, yeah, we'll give you a chance. And so those 12 months, I spent in McLaren and the reason that I, I sort of say like industrial placements, internships, like you guys were saying, is so important because during those 12 months, I was able to sort of understand what made the company tick, like what, mm -hmm. what it was about, um, what things they were struggling with, because every company doesn't have the amount of resource to do everything that they want, right? There's always going to be like an area of science or R&D that they can't quite tap because they don't have the funds, the resources, whatever. And so I found like a little material science problem. I was like, right, okay, this is my bargaining chip. Like, <laughs> you see, um, I've got to go back and complete my master's. And so I sort of said to them, I was like, look, if I can come up with a solution for this, or if I can work on this using all my resources back at Manchester Uni, um, then if I come up with a solution, like, could you give me a job? And they did. And they sort of said, yep, if you can make this work, then we'll have a position as materials engineer, which they haven't had before. So they created it. And so it was a stressful few months. Yeah. <laughs> but fortunately, I managed to sort of find something. And that's why I think it's so crucial, because if you're able to be placed in a company and find out what they need, then you can go and study and use, we call it a dissertation, but I guess it's like a final year project. Um, you can go back and use that. Uh, to sort of make you a desirable candidate when you finish your master's or finish um, your, your degree, school, whatever it may be. That's awesome. I think that's awesome for your first, you know, full-time and or, you know, industry or internship role, you were able to do that. A learning experience, you learned a yeah. lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I find that really amazing that you essentially, it sounds like pitched yourself and your abilities and your skills to the company I feel like you need to have a lot of confidence to do that. And oftentimes when we're talking to guests and just talking amongst ourselves about being woman in STEM, I feel like confidence is a pretty big theme. So can you talk a little bit more about like, how do you feel confidence and just your overall passion for the STEM career has really helped you um, with your work thus far? Yeah, it's, it's such a crucial topic, Libby, honestly, like we could talk about imposter syndrome, women in this space, when you're the only woman in the room, right? You sort of doubt yourself. You think, God, no one looks like me here, or am I making the right decisions? And it's, it's a, a topic I love to talk about because I think there's huge room for improvement. I by no means sort of con would call myself like an incredibly confident person. I think um, what I've been able to do is sort of be comfortable in, in my ability and mm -hmm. because I've been the only materials engineer in a company where everyone's sort of saying, oh, don't listen to her. Like she's she's young. She does, she's not even a mechanical engineer. Like I'm very confident in what I've been able to achieve. But of course, I have like doubts or, <laughs> you know, in meeting rooms and you're like, oh, God, I'm not sure, quite sure um, how to say this. But yeah, I think uh, where was I going with that? I don't know. I think uh, basically confidence comes with if you're able to sort of like practice your ability absolutely mm -hmm. um but oh where's that going with that i can't remember <laughs> i had a really <laughs> crucial point <laughs> <laughs> what was your question of it you well I, yeah I mean I just feel like, like yeah. pitching yourself like I, I'm thinking about like just myself with if there was a company that I really loved and I like really wanted to work there and I saw this gap I don't know if I would be able to just go to them and be like hey guys I can do this for you like I can solve this problem like I just really admire that oh, you were yes. able to do that 
Yes. Okay. So yeah, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say that I was confident back then and even look reflecting back on those decisions and everything that I sort of really ballsy went in with all of that. <laughs> I think, I, I think it wasn't necessarily confidence. I think I just felt that I had nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of sort of, uh, I talk a lot about that with students and sort of saying like, what, have you got to lose? We have an incredible resource at our fingertips, LinkedIn, you can message people, really use your network that you already have. And I do look back at it and I think, oh my goodness, I don't think I could have, (laughs) you know, sort of written them a letter, it was a letter in the end, um, sent my CV off with it. And I was like, oh wow, I don't know if I could have done that. But actually, um, yeah, I just, I was a young student. I, you, t- you miss a hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. Right. So I was just like, right, let's send it off. And I didn't think much of it. And I was uh, processing other applications. And then it just shows you that some of these things pattern, some of these things work out and you've got, just got to go for it. And my God, I'm so glad that I did. Definitely. Awesome. The, uh, yeah. That reminds me of the quote. If you don't ask, the answer is no. Yes, exactly, exactly. (laughs) Awesome. Well, would you like to give kind of some background about IET and then we can get into your involvement with them? Yeah, absolutely. So the IET Institute of Engineering and Technology is basically like a faculty that has been around for many, many years that supports um, engineering Uh, educational systems it it gives um, people resources teachers resources to sort of spread their knowledge about stem and when i talk about stem science technology engineering and maths for those of you who don't know and um yeah i was fortunate enough to win the award that they do young women engineer of the year a couple of years ago and this award in particular i think is like so important that we talk about because of course people could say like, oh why is it young women engineer of the year why is it men why is it not men for instance but this literally has changed my life like the the day that i won it um i was then being called at like 6 a.m the next day by all these press people these oh, media wow. people and the coverage that this institute has is incredible and i think when we talk about women in the engineering space, um, what the, the reach and what they're able to sort of showcase with what these winners do is incredible. I mean, the messages that you get, right? I mean, I'm sure you guys are just the same when you get messages from young girls, maybe on Instagram, LinkedIn, or the reach and the grandparents, the teachers, the carers, whatever it may be, you're like, ah, oh, this is exactly why I do this because I know that I've been able to make a difference in little Sophie's life or little Matt's life. Like, you know, mm-hmm. it's just incredible. So. That's what the IET do. Um, And the award, yeah, like I said, has speak wonders for me. Um, And it's currently open, applications are open at the moment. So if you know anyone who's like inspirational um, for uh, their work that they do in science or even engineering, even tech, um, do go and recommend them because it's incredible. <laughs> well, what does the um, nomination process look like for that? Like, for example, when you won the award, do you know who nominated you? Did you nominate yourself? Um, and for our listeners, if they do know someone who would be a good candidate for the award, how do they go about doing that nomination? Yeah, so it's all online. Um, I think the best sort of way to get to it, you could just Google the IET or Young Women Engineer of the Year or come up. I did nominate myself, actually which I think, again, women are less likely to do. So if you've got a friend or you've got a colleague that you want to recommend, like give them a little bit of a push, you can do it for them. But I think in order to make sure that everything, all the details are correct, you also need their um, their manager or their boss's sort of buy-in from it. Um, but yeah, it's all online. I did it myself. I got recommended to do it by someone on Twitter. And actually I went back to my boss and I was like, mm, I'm not sure. I- I don't know, I feel funny about like recommending myself to do this and stuff. And he was like, okay. And he was great, by the way. If you get a good manager, you ladies know, like this is just incredible. And he's such a champion for this kind of thing. He said, you've done so much this year. If you're not gonna do it this year and you're never gonna do it, so just go for it. And I was like, okay, filled it out. Um, Similar form that you guys would have done maybe in assessment centers, job interviews, describe a little bit about yourself. Um, what you've done in volunteering work and stuff. 
and uh, also a little piece from your manager. So he wrote a little paragraph and he was amazing with it. And yeah, the rest is history. I mean, I can't believe it's across all divisions as well. I say that I'm a materials engineer, but I was up against like electronics engineer, transportation engineers. These women were saving lives. And I was like, I just create really fast cars for rich people. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it worked. <laughs> I feel like if I was in a room with those women, my imposter syndrome would really be flaring up because I'd be like, wow, everybody's so incredible here. (laughs) Yes. And do you know what it did, Libby? Honestly, it did. And it wasn't until maybe two months after I actually had the title, I was just, I was like, oh my goodness, they're inventing synthetic blood. They're saving lives. I'm literally just creating cars and... (laughs) I was found myself on stage like thinking, doing all these speeches, thinking actually, and I just got lucky because McLaren is a name, right? I mean, I tell you guys about the cars, you sort of nod, you're like, yeah, I understand who they are. And I, I talk to most people who are in the motorsport space in the UK and they're like, oh my God, McLaren. I'm like, is it just the brand? Have I gotten really lucky here? Um, but actually going back to the, the social comms that you get, receiving letters and, um instagram stuff twitter stuff linkedin stuff from people who have been on the receiving end of a youtube video or something like that they literally just they were the reason that i was like ah i'm exactly where i want to be like if i was able to make it an, an influence or a difference to these people's lives then actually i do deserve this this makes me feel good and i want to do more so yeah but imposter syndrome honey it came into it <laughs> it was a big life lesson learning to, to overcome that for real i'm sure <laughs> so this award is open for everyone outside of the uk as well to be nominated for correct just wanna I, yeah i believe so i believe so okay. it might be worth a google to sort of see if it is about outside the uk i don't know that fact but I know it is um, open until the 1st of July. So yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. I did do a little bit just to try and see what the nomination process looked like. It looked like it was open. So to our listeners, you don't have to be based in the UK. Oh, fabulous. There we go. Thanks, Lexi. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I don't know. That's from that's what I think, but we can all, we'll put in the notes. We'll put in the show notes. We'll yeah. clarify. Uh. <laughs> Awesome. So did you find out about IET through that Twitter message or is this, you know, an organization that you knew about? Um... I have been familiar with them for a fair few years because of its reach and the media coverage that the the kind of institute does get. Obviously, there are some inspirational women in that space that I was like, okay, who are these people? Like, how did they get to where they are? And you sort of look back and they're like, oh, okay, they won IET Young Women Engineer of the Year a few years ago. They've gone on to do this. So I was fully aware of it. Um, But of course, when it got recommended to me, I was like, God, do I qualify? Like, then you get into it, don't you? Sort of see like what the requirements are. So yeah, I was familiar before because it makes it, it makes it like, cool it makes it puts these women who are doing incredible jobs it puts them on a pedestal and it just makes it more relatable so everyone's i was sort of being looking at on on twitter or following on linkedin and stuff like that I, i was sort of very aware of that there are some like amazing ladies out there and they have come up through this space so they they do it really well the iet they sort of make it um make it look like well, they, they show it how it is. It's not all just like grubby, <laughs> boy in a suit. No, yeah. It's actually, you could change the world. You could be fighting cancer. Like you could, you could do this. And yeah, I love the IT. <laughs> it's been really awesome. good. Yeah, you can tell, you know, how you speak so highly of it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about maybe those speeches or any events after, you know, post, um, you know, getting this award? Talk about, you know, kind of what happened then. Yeah, so gosh, it was crazy. The day after, it was more like radio interviews. It was kind of during COVID, so a lot of it was virtual. But I tell you what, I, you guys probably felt the same, that it meant less travel. <laughs> and I was like, actually, I can do a lot of this stuff and get a lot of my message across to a lot of people from my bedroom. And I was seriously so kind of relieved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys have probably found the same with your podcast, like more people were tuning into stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was mainly uh, radio interviews, um, 
live streaming to classrooms, colleges, schools, that kind of thing. But there were a few moments that like properly stood out to me um, and that I'll remember forever. Now we have this program that's called Blue Peter, which is like this uh, children's program on, on TV that when you grow up in like the UK, you always watch Blue Peter and they give you like a special badge if you ever make it onto the show or if you've done something incredible. Now we had a, a, an opportunity at McLaren to do like this competition of like des design your own supercar. So we wanted to sort of launch that. And then Blue Peter, this particular company reached out and was like, yeah, we'd love to do it. <laughs> so they came over to the office and we had to do all this filming and stuff. And obviously they're like, right, so you're gonna be on the show. Um, we just need to put this badge on you. And then they just gave it to me in like the most casual manner. They were like, here's your badge. And I was like, <laughs> the golden yeah. badge you're like oh. yeah forgetting that of course i was a, a youth in the uk who just like that was the pinnacle and they just handed it to me and i was like they're like oh gosh is this a moment i was like yeah it's a moment. <laughs> is this a moment <laughs> so yeah that was great and then um i had a, a fantastic conversation with quite a, a high up politician in the uk who was on International Women's Day, he was wanting to make a difference about getting women in, in the economy and what we can do to get to fill more STEM positions in the UK with women. So that was phenomenal as well. And then from then, it's all just taken off, really. <laughs> Lots of busy stuff, but I love it. I love it. Do you think that, uh, you know, what IET is doing at, with this Young Woman Engineers Award and not only that, but just like the talks that you've had and things in social media, do you think all of that exposure, I guess, for our younger listeners or younger girls out there listening is important to, so that they can learn more about engineering or how do you think that could influence them in the future? Oh gosh, a hundred percent. I mean, oh, I think it's so important. And mm -hmm. especially, I mean, you girls can resonate as well with your podcast and how you make it relatable. And you talk about, you know, what it was like you going through the educational process or you um, studying for it and what kind of stigmas and stereotypes you've had to go through. It's just the same. And I think when, if I reflect on my time back at school, yes, I understood what engineering was at a young age. Um, I wanted to do it anyway, but that didn't mean that I didn't have friends or even family members who were sort of saying, oh, Ella, like, you're quite a girl's girl. Like, you wouldn't want to get into that. Do you realize you might have to wear a boiler suit for the rest of your life? Or you don't want to um, work in high vis or something like that. And, um, and then it puts doubts in your head and you think, well, actually, I think I really enjoy that, though. And then you sort of say, oh, OK, maybe that's not right for me. Maybe girls don't do that. And so broadcasting something like the IET Young Women Engineer of the Year it sort of shows like, yes, of course you can do that. And this is what it looks like. It doesn't necessarily um, fit those stereotypes that you're, you're taught in school. And I, I go to a lot of schools and there are um, girls who are interested in science and they think the most natural progression for them is just to become a doctor, which is great, of course, but maybe they weren't aware of what I did or they had loads of um, girls who I think you guys probably get the same program, but it's called like Drive to Survive, like the Formula One program on Netflix that has okay. like blown everyone's opinion of motorsport out the water. So I go to schools and girls be like, oh, so do you actually work in that Drive to Survive place? Can you work on the cars? I was like, yeah, that's my job. Like this Aww. is this is what you can do. And so it makes it so relatable. So a hundred percent, yes, this award is important to um, show young girls and boys that you can have a career in, in STEM and it can be cool and you can make just as much a difference doing that than um, being like an influencer, for instance. And I think I do notice a change. It will be interesting to hear what you guys think. But when I go to schools and you have, um, we have like high school, obviously, that you guys are familiar with, but then the cutoff is at 10 to 11 years old, I think, before they go on to the next school. And so when they go from that first school, we call primary school, onto that, it's like 11, 12, 13, I notice such a difference. So they go from being, yes, I want to be an astronaut. And I'm like, brilliant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, they, then suddenly it, it, it flicks to actually, uh, I think I want to be a social media influencer. And I'm like, what do you want from that? Do you want to change lives? Like, do you want to impact people? Do you want to do this? And they said, yes, 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 that's what I want to do. And I was like, you can do that in STEM. Like mm -hmm. I get those exact feels from it and it's amazing. And you can still sort of like 
fix badass machines and stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So going off of, you know, social media and its, you know, impact on, you know, younger girls and encouraging girls to go into STEM, when did you decide that you wanted to become an advocate for women in STEM? So was it after, you know, you went through this award nomination process and you achieved the award or was were you kind of focusing on this prior to uh, obtaining the award? Yeah, much, much uh, further before I got the award, actually. And the reason being is because I entered a space that is very, very male dominated. Mm -hmm. So I went to a a girls school. So there's no boys in my school. That meant my physics class, my chemistry class were like 16 to 18 girls deep. And it was just great fun. You know, I didn't really realize that there was a gender disparity in the science engineering space went on to university to do that degree of materials engineering. And there about a third of my classmates were were female. And I was like, okay, you know, there's not as many women here. And then of course, when I got that job at McLaren, um, and I do think the automotive sector is still significantly behind that of the the chemical materials, um, oil and gas industry, like they, they have, progression to be made and I don't know whether it is the stigma associated with cars you know still like petrol heads we call them are still like very masculine dominated maybe they market cars in a way that it can only be like a a man's toy whatever Mm -hmm. it may be but I you know I, I got to a company like that and I was like okay my job is amazing I love it but why am I the only woman in this team of like hundreds (laughs) hundreds <laughs> amen to and that why am I the only woman? yeah in this um meeting room and so that moment when I joined that company I was like I've got the I love my job and I've got to I've got to tell all the girls at school I've got to tell the young girls boys that actually this is out here um and uh and you can do this because I, I can't believe like this is the the situation and so it was from that moment then and then I sort of volunteered a lot and went to do all these speeches and yeah, loads of assemblies and presentations came off the back of that because I wanted to make a difference and showcase what was out there. And then the awards sort of, I think I got a lot of um, recognition for that in the application process of the hours that I committed. Awesome. So entering such a male dominated industry, did you have any uncomfortable situations being, you know, one of the only women in the department or on the team? And how did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I won't, I won't necessarily go into specifics, but you guys can imagine, like, it's, it's difficult. I had a double whammy of being um, young uh, in a, in a profession that they haven't seen before. So if I was suddenly to, to make a suggestion that we need to change material that they've been using for eight years <laughs> prior to me, and sort of 20 year old me comes in and be like, actually, I think we need to switch this. They're like, who is this? <laughs> so that was a, a, a sort of a factor. And then of course, being a woman in that space as well. So yeah, there was a lot to be learned quite quickly. Um, but that actually touches upon a point that I, I raised earlier about Um, I'm quite confident in my ability because I felt that in those early days, I had to prove myself a lot more. And yes, you have like comments, whatever it may be, um, that make a character building, like makes you a tougher person. But I learned two things really, that as soon as I arrived, I thought I had to change my persona, change the way I acted, the the way I dressed um, in order to fit in. Um, and I thought, you know, being in a car space, being in a company full of men, I thought I had to be really tough and shouty and sort of fit in to that. But actually, I learned the long way round that after six months of doing that, when you're exhausted and you're not yourself, <laughs> it's actually you can be a, a, such a, a, a more a better engineer by embracing your individuality. And now I go the complete opposite way. So I have like my acrylic nails on. Yes. Put my heels on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pink pens. <laughs> and I can do a much better job if I embrace who I am, right? Um, but then the second thing was that the, the way that I was able to sort of change people's minds was by relying on science. So we all work in a profession, right? Where it's data driven. It's factual driven. And I was in meetings, people maybe disagree with the, the, 
the suggestion that I had or the, the report that I'd written. And so it just took me a little bit longer to refer back to literature or compare it to something or get more data to prove my point. And like I said, we're, we're in a situation where we can do that and that's great. And I did re rely on that a lot. So when I got kicked back, I was like, okay, no worries. Like, we'll just remove all like the, the passion and the, the personality from this equation. Let me go back and I'll get some more data. And it was a longer process that way, but I do think that I'm, I managed to get a little more respect from doing it that like that. Um, so yeah, use the science, honestly, it, it helped me. And now they don't second guess me. <laughs> Sometimes they do, but now I'm like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I absolutely love that process because again, you know, I'm not in the automotive industry, but I'm in the medical device industry. Mm -hmm. So I literally am doing things by the book. If someone gets mad, I say, this is literally like, I'm not, you know, making anything up. I'm not, you know, being innovative. Yeah. This is literally what we have to do. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. it, then they get really quiet and they're like, oh. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotta read it. Gotta read the standards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it sounds like, um, you know, more initiatives like what e or IET is doing with the Young Woman Engineer uh, of the Year Award is really hopefully going to heart help start, you know, break down those barriers and hopefully mm. get more women out there in, uh, in these fields. Absolutely. Yeah, I can already see a difference, you know, I think. I've been at the company four years, five years, including that industrial placement and the, the number of women who are getting into product development and then engineering is already increasing. So it's slow, but mm -hmm. we're getting there. And it, another thing on that point is that I think what I like to talk about is yes, role models are important. We're getting to a stage where we're seeing more women in executive positions, both in the States, the UK, um, but don't don't sit around and wait for someone who looks like you or who you can relate to gets into your industry. I think if I can reflect on anything that's happened in my life is that if I was waiting for someone to go in and situate a position in McLaren or be a materials engineer in McLaren, I'll still be waiting. Like I, I just went for it. And I think you've, you've just got to go for it, haven't you? If you've got a passion, you've got a company that you want to work for, ask, reach out, go for it. Mm. Um, role models are important, but don't let them, uh, don't wait for them to happen f to allow you to think you've got to go and get it. Love that. Definitely. So circling back uh, to IET a little bit, um, do you have any other init you know initiatives or events coming up um, as you know a winner of the YWE award? Um, it seems you know it seems like you're very involved, so that's why I want to ask if there is you know are any presentations coming up that maybe our listeners can tune into you know via Zoom or anything? Yeah, so. Um... I am, pro I'm two years sort of out. <laughs> so I've handed my gold diamond encrusted young woman engineer <laughs> baton <laughs> onto, onto um, another girl called Kira, Kira. And she's out doing like an amazing events and they're all sort of detailed on the IET's Twitter. Um, there are features of webinars, talk shows, whatever it may be, YouTube, all on that. And you can find those details all over the IET social media. Um, so I sort of I dip in and out. I'm in the nice stage now where it's not the mad year after I've won it because that was crazy. Um, now I sort of do a few little bits, maybe when the awards come about again, I get to do like lovely podcasts like this, for instance. Um, but now I sort of get to pick and choose what I do. <laughs> so it's a lot more relaxed. But yeah, there's tons of events that anyone all over the world can tune into um, and you can just find them on what the IT get up to. Absolutely. Awesome. And we will, of course, link everything in the show notes for our yes. listeners. Yes. Um, so we usually end our you know interviews with one question for our guests. But before we ask that question, I have another question. What is your favorite car? I, oh. I wanted to ask this from the beginning, but I was like, don't start with that. I was like, I need to know now. <laughs> You know, what is your dream, you know, dream uh, car? <laughs> well, I know I'm obviously very incredibly biased, <laughs> as you know, the company I work for. But I, ha I have to admit, like, I mean, the reason that I got into that company, right, I've, I've talked about it, is the fact that I thought the cars were like the greatest cars in the world. I had a poster of one. Um, and I think... I'm going to have two, okay? <laughs> Lexi, allow me to. <laughs> so that P1, that P1, which was the, the 
like hybrid car that was on the poster that I was dreaming about. Um, and that was the one that made me pick up my pen and, and write off to McLaren. That of course is glorious. That one is so glam, like it was brought about six years ago and you look at it now and it still looks good. Oh, I just love it. <laughs> um, and yeah, and now I get to, it's all like in the office, it's all positioned in something we call the Boulevard, which is this big walk. I get to walk past it every time I go to lunch. I'm oh, like, that's cool. one day. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, let me go find the keys. You're like, where are the keys? I'm gonna drive to lunch. Drive away. <laughs> scary, scary. <laughs> I tell you what, actually, a little perk. Anyone on the fence wanting to be an engineer, whatever, um, I do get to drive them. Oh. I do get to drive them. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. And to, to, to get to sort of experience the product that you're working on, I think it's really, really cool. But P1, ultimate favorite, dream car. I've had it in my sights for years. But I think the coolest one or the one that has a special place in my heart that I've worked on would have to be the McLaren Speedtail. Now, this is another hyper uh, GT car. So part battery, part um, combustion engine. And the thing that was special about this, it was, I think it retailed for about 2.1, 2.2 million pounds. Oh, so wow. we're talking big bucks here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Pocket, pocket change, right? <laughs> yeah. Get that sitting on my desk. <laughs> a long time before I own one of them. Um, but what was cool is that everything that I worked with as a materials engineer was just ridiculous. Like the, the front badge alone was platinum gold with like this beautiful marbleized carbon fiber. And that was like 10, <laughs> oh my 10, God. 10, 10, insane. Pounds. Yeah. And then they just had like beautiful titanium alloys, the most incredible leather. And so all these materials, I just felt like so special working on. I was just like parading all these really fancy <laughs> components around the lab. And I was like, yeah, yeah this is probably my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> So what you're telling me is that if I cut out coffee for a year, I can afford one of these cars. You know, my coffee money is, I'll just put it towards the, yeah. the piggy bank. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Can you talk about, okay, so I said that was my last question, but I just, you know, this is so cool just to hear about, you know, again, like you said, this is a very well-known name. It's an awesome company. Um, can you talk about your favorite project you've worked on? Maybe, maybe it was the one you just mentioned because your face lit up, but... <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a cool project, don't get me wrong. I think it was just very elaborate, bougie, whatever you want to call it. It was just ridiculous. Um, and that, that came about with challenges that I just love to sort of uh, work on. But, hmm, I think closely second would be the new Artura. So that is a hybrid car that we've just bought out. And what I think is exciting about this, which you guys will be feeling the impact of as well, is when cars move towards electrification. So all cars are going to be battery driven. We have a law in the UK that means that by 2030, most manufacturers actually have to manufacture an electric car. So there's this big sort of push to make cars lighter because these battery systems are so heavy, right? So we have to make what was already, I mean, these supercars, um, yeah, supercars are so, so light because they have to go fast anyway. If we're going to be putting a battery in there, we need to be taking this mass out from other places on the car. And so as a materials driven person, like that's quite interesting. We've got to start to think about interesting ways on how to remove the weight. And yes, you can do that through the obvious choices like swapping out a less dense material with something, um, uh, whether it be like changing aluminium for magnesium, for instance, or you can start to think about how it's manufactured. And what was interesting with the Artura, this, this latest one that we're just launching now, is that yes, we thought about those material choices, but we also thought about like the panels. So the body panels, all that, the something that goes over the door or the, the front fenders, whatever it may be, those painted parts that you see. We have created like material science techniques that meant that we had less of them. So if you think about how many panels go onto a car, you have behind that brackets, bolts, mm -hmm. fasteners, everything that you have to fix it with. So if you can make three panels into one, that's less bracketry, that's less um, nuts and bolts and stuff like that. So actually we're getting like really creative with where we're removing the weight and material science had a big part to play. So there's a 
glorious like rear clam we call it on the Arturo which is like the biggest body panel that we've done in aluminium and that was that was proper cool I really like that <laughs> so that's the long-winded awesome. way Arturo being another one <laughs> I'm gonna be googling all these cars <laughs> yeah I, mean, I was gonna say I want to go look at what these look like <laughs> Um, so what is like, what is the most significant customization you've had? So you talked about the hairdryer, like color, you know, matching, mm-hmm. but is there anything that you saw someone ask for, you never thought about it and you're like, you know, in one day I want to have that customization in my car. Oh, that's, a good, that's a good question. I've had some, yeah, I've had some wild, wild customizations, but like, let me just say money doesn't buy taste. <laughs> so I was just sort of like... <laughs> Um, but yeah, gosh, we have had, I would say, I'm, I, I quite like the flamboyant stuff. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to spend half a million pounds, a million pounds on a car, I want it to look good. And we had some beautiful, uh, I think it was a Chinese customer and he wanted this gold stitching of like this golden dragon oh my into gosh. his leather seat. Yeah, and it had to be like a particular type of gold. And of course, we had to make sure that it was just as durable as seat stitching was going to be on our production cars and stuff like that. So that was really, really cool. Um, And then the gold plated exhaust system. Uh, again, it was like very subtle because you can't see all of it, and it was underneath like this grill. But when you peered into the grill, you're like, "Oh, that's gold!" Oh my gosh! <laughs> you're like, that's, that's bougie. Yeah. And the funny story about the funny story about that is that um, obviously we we said yes, of course, no problem, we'll do this. And then the team are like, "Ella," <laughs> I'm like, "Yes." And then we have to figure out a way on how to make this gold stick and stuff and. It was a, a funny situation that we found ourselves in when it wasn't working directly. And, uh, and then they called me and then they, this sort of all this gold flake was like flying out the car. And I'm <laughs> sort of standing there like, this is a really surreal moment. <laughs> Felt like You're like, do I grab it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had some funny ones. But yeah, I'll yeah. definitely put gold on it, I think. Yeah. That's wow. awesome. Is there anything you guys had to say no to? Like, is there anything that was crazy, crazy, like not possible? Interesting. Not not the stuff that I've had. We've kind of worked through a solution. So sometimes we would have to coat it in something clear or ceramic or something to make it stick or to make it durable to heat, which would make the car heavier. But there would always be like a, a, a compromise for us to do something like that. But yeah, the, all the ones that I have have been go ahead. So wow. that's awesome. Yeah, look at you, innovative. You're like, we're yeah. gonna find a way. <laughs> You're like, do you want a hairbrush with the hair with the hair dryer? You're like, I'll give you all. We'll sort it. <laughs> Full package. New Dyson dryer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Awesome. Okay, I think that's all my car questions. I'm sorry for going on a for digressing, but um, again, you know, it's super cool. And I wanted to, you know, make a comment. So my background is in chemical engineering, and you know, you made a comment before. People don't think chemical engineers or you know maybe materials engineers can go into this industry, which I had the same thought process. So it's I'm so happy you were able to come and speak about your experience, you know, in the automotive industry, um, you know, as someone with that background. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that'll be very beneficial to our listeners. Yeah, good. And just, sorry, I know we've got to wrap up, but um, on that point, I think companies are going to broaden their their talent search to Mm -hmm. sort of um, appeal to people of greater backgrounds. I mean, I obviously see it from uh, an automotive point of view. As we go towards electrification, there are things like computers and software engineers and people who are involved right. in that space that we would never have considered for a car company and I, I see it all all across the stem space like no longer a chemical engineers going on to work for chemical um factories you know it's it's their skill set is um sort of appreciated by multiple industries so don't ever think that if you go on to study that you have to go into this company because it's just not like that 100 percent Definitely. Yeah, because I feel like nowadays there's so many trainings that they allow you to sign up for. And like, you know, I guess it's not really a good way to put it, but you can Google anything. You can learn anything. So yeah, but maybe absolutely. I don't know, maybe they want you to have the, the, the degree and not bank on Google. But 
I don't know. No, there, there are skills <laughs> that translate, and you would never, you would never even consider that. Like, for instance, chemical engineers, we employ because we know that you're like so good at figuring out processes and efficiency and how plants work and how like the best way to do things is and that we just say right we, we know we'd love to have your skill set so yeah don't worry google's always there of course but think of those soft soft skills that you've learned that you wouldn't even know that you've learned sort of thing yeah and hopefully our listeners can take some inspiration from you ella and if there's something that they want to do go out and do it go you know, yes. go present yourself and make, make the opportunity yours. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Any takeaways like that would be fab. I'll be so happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, to close out this podcast, Ella, thank you again so much for being on it. We like to ask our guests um, all this last question, and that is, what is one piece of advice that you could give your younger self knowing what you know now? Good question. I obviously would say all the things that we've discussed go for it be brave don't sit and wait for these opportunities to come and get you um the being a woman in this space may put you in a spotlight but actually use it go for it i've had some incredible opportunities open up to me because i'm going to like a women only conference um and uh if they, they want a female speaker then they want a female speaker but use that opportunity um, but if we were to pick a particular piece of advice, I think the thing that I would sort of say to my younger self would be, don't worry about failure. And I know in the UK, especially, um, the, our exam systems put a lot of pressure on students. I'm sure it's the same over there mm -hmm. that you sort of go through school thinking, oh my goodness, like I've got to get the best grades. And every time you sort of have a slip and then you're like, oh, it's going to ruin my career. And I was so in that and I was so worried about um, achieving sort of the highest level that I could and I'll get really down in the dumps if I did fail. The company that I now work at has actually proved to me, and I know this is the same across um, multiple engineering STEM companies, that they've proven to me that failure is good and they want people to fail. They fail fast and learn quicker. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of our mantra that we go by. Um, and it's all about how you pick yourself up. It's all about how you apply yourself to the next thing. So do not worry about failure. You learn a lot from it. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, fail first, learn, learn quicker. What a great way to end the podcast. So do you wanna plug yourself? Where can our listeners find you? Ah, yes. So, well, my username for most socials is Ella underscore Podmore, P-O-D-M-O-R-E. You can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it may be. I sort of post a lot about what I get up to um, on my job role there. But yeah, get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> love that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank oh, you so thanks, much for being girls. here. I can't believe I got the opportunity yeah. to be on it when I listen to it so much. This is so cool. I know, I love that. <laughs> All right, thank you again to Ella for taking the time to come on the podcast. I thought that was an awesome interview. We learned about her experience in the automotive industry at an amazing company like McLaren, as well as IET and their Young Woman Engineer of the Year Awards. Yeah, and for those listening, if you guys have anyone in mind that you could potentially nominate for this award, we would highly recommend looking into it. We're going to have all the details um, for IET, like their website, and how to apply for the Young Woman, of, Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award in our show notes. Say that five times fast. I know. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's so hard for my brain to say the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. <laughs> Yes, but we are super excited and we have loved learning about IET and their upcoming initiatives. So make sure to check out their website. Yeah. And I think like, you know, their mission aligns perfectly with what we're trying to do on this podcast, which is just further trying to encourage women and girls and, and boys to get into STEM and just all the opportunities um, and career fields that you can potentially do and like basically all the ways that you can change the world by going into STEM fields. Yes, awesome. Well, with that, in our next episode, you'll catch us telling you all about our week. Mm -hmm. um, so this one, we wanted to focus on IET and get you know their their message out there about these these awards. Yeah, definitely. 
So I think with that, we can go ahead and close out today's podcast episode. Just a little bit of um, house cleaning at the end of the episode. Make sure you guys are following us on our socials. And also we have our Facebook group, which um, people are actively using. I love to see that. Um, we're getting some good um, activity on the Facebook group. So if you haven't already, definitely join that. Yes. And all of that information is in our Instagram at my best friends and engineer in our bio. Mm -hmm. So make sure to check out that link tree. That's yes, in there. definitely. And if you guys want to follow the podcast on socials, um, we have our Instagram and our TikTok, which is at my best friends and engineer. And what else did you say? The YouTube? <laughs> our YouTube? <laughs> which our YouTube is BFE podcast. Yes. And Lexi, where can they find you on socials? You can find me at Engineer Lexi on TikTok and Instagram. And then How about you? You can find me uh, at Libby Beyond the Label on Instagram and TikTok. And yeah, definitely share this podcast with your friends, especially if they love cars, because I bet they're going to geek out about <laughs> hearing Ella talk all about how she's a material engineer for cars. Literally, that's so cool. Yes. I can't wait to talk to my guy friends about this. I'll say, ha ha. <laughs> we'll I say, talk to someone who helps <laughs> make McLarens. Ha ha, she gets to test drive them and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. You have them as your wallpaper. Yep. <laughs> she has them as office decor. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so, okay, awesome. Make sure you guys are tuning in weekly on Mondays to catch new episodes of My Best Friends and Engineer. And anything else to add, Lexi, before we close it out? Nope. That's that's it. That's all for me. That's a wrap, folks. Are you ready? That's a wrap. All Are right. you ready for this? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm Lexi. And I'm Libby. And thanks for listening to my and best And thanks for listening to my best friends and engineer. I never know what these